In traffic, situations change in a blink of an eye and decisions have to be made instantly. The difference between saving and losing a human life may depend on a millisecond. A computer is able to assess risks much faster than human beings. Therefore, a car driving autonomously could be a safer option to a human driver. Automated traffic is no longer science fiction. Partly autonomous cars are already driving in traffic in the United States and soon in the other parts of the world as well. However, the thought of cars driving by themselves can be scary. In many other industries, automation and artificial intelligence have already replaced human beings. Our everyday lives would become difficult without artificial intelligence, technology and their nervous system, the Internet. By using smart devices, we give more and more power to artificial intelligence and it will soon make dangerous choices. What are you building? It's our house. What's this room? That's the center where I go to school. And this? Where the computer lives. Does the computer know everything? I mean, like, how many times to exercise and all? I haven't the faintest notion. That's just too much for your old mother to understand. The Internet, and especially wireless networks, have revolutionized the way we use different devices. Technology isn't limited to one operating environment or for one purpose anymore. It studies us and modifies its operations according to our needs while collecting information from both the user and other devices. This is called the Internet of Things. Mike, how about chicken salad? Ugh. Cheese omelet? Cheese burger, some french fries and a nice cold bottle of beer. I'll see. In practice, the Internet of Things means that objects and devices are given a unique identity and they start to exchange data between each other and with us. The Internet of Things makes our everyday life easier. Devices such as smart televisions, smartphones and smart home appliances have made visions of the future a reality. Mike, would you make me a dupe of that? I'd like to show it to some friends of ours who spend a lot of time down there. Sure, well, I guess you want it in 3D, huh? Yeah, we finally made the switch. <laughs> you gotta keep up with the times, you know. Yeah, but, um... But what? What's next? Hello! Welcome to the Smart Home IQ Demo Home. We have a distributed audio and video throughout the entire house. We have our Apple TV, our PlayStation, Logitech Squeeze Box with our Pandora account, Direct TV boxes, a Mosaic server, and we have that distributed in every room. You can access that stuff in every room. Well, Lawn started in the home market a little over 25 years ago when we developed some of the first distributed audio solutions and home intercom and communication solutions. Um, I have all my tabs right here. I have the home tab, the security tab, the climate, the lighting, the media, the messaging, the video and the photos. We also were the first to deliver what's called today cloud features, if you will. So remote access to the house from a computer to both set up and support a system, but also from the homeowner so that they can remotely log into their house, manage the home's climate or irrigation or monitor the security system while they're away. If you think of your car, a car manufacturer owns the bumper to bumper on the car. So they can put things in that car that work together. So when you press button one in my car, my seat goes back, my mirrors adjust, and now I've got the car set up for me. And that's very valuable. Um, other cars, you know, when you're driving and, you're, and, and there's uh, road noise, um, the radio volume adjusts. And these are all things that we enjoy in our cars, but can't necessarily enjoy in our house. So putting these systems in that uh, work together can provide comfort, convenience, and peace of mind or safety. The automation system will soon be able to determine um, who's in the house, which family member's in the house. Um, oh, okay, it's the teenager who um, only stays on this floor on this day. He always goes to the kitchen right after school. It'll light up from this time to this time. It'll know when how many people have been in and out of the house. 
Um, it'll look at the history and see um, how much toilet paper you're using and how much ketchup you've been using. And it'll be able to already um, start purchasing, uh, logging on to your Safeway account or your Amazon account to replenish these household items. Um, and, um, and you can get an alert on your phone saying, uh, would you like to authorize this purchase to refill your ketchup? The market right now uh, for the connected home and the integrated or the Internet of Things home is explosive. Um, we're really at the beginning of what we call the hockey stick, where your growth starts and then it goes way up. This is going to be a you know, $15, $16 billion market in the next five years. And what's driving that is... First of all, the, uh, the traction that the smartphones are getting. Everybody's managing their life from a phone. Um, so now, manage your home life. So I can just hit with the click of the button and then turn them off. And there you go. The Internet of Things will revolutionize a lot more than just our homes. The use of devices that operate independently or are operated remotely will become more versatile in our everyday lives and in industry as well. The Internet of Things is also changing the way we communicate. Thanks to technology, geographical location will be less and less important in communication. Beam Pro is basically a smart presence system. So it allows me to be somewhere in the world and actually have a presence there without having to physically have my body there. I live in New York and I work in California every single day, completely self-sufficient on my own. I don't need any help. I show up on my own. I leave when I want to. I can do everything I would without ever having to actually go there. Most video conferencing requires between two and five megabits of bandwidth per second in and out for a perfect call quality. So for a perfect call, you're talking about 10 megabits of bandwidth where we just need one for that same call quality. That's in large part due to our software being written from the ground up specifically for this purpose. So we've optimized everything we possibly can. It's really low latency. So when I talk, you hear it. When you talk, I hear it right away. And it's as live and realistic as we can possibly make um, video conferencing right now. Hey, Michelle, how's the weather? That is good. It's like sunny, 65. It's no big deal, like normal day in California in February. Universities, businesses, um, hospitals, um, you know, even people's homes around around the country. Um, there's a lot of different applications for Beam. You know, we, we say that anywhere where you communicate and move around, a Beam is going to work. My favorite example is uh, we have a young boy in middle school right now who's suffering from leukemia. Uh, there's actually a beam in his middle school. He's a couple hundred miles away or however far away he is in a hospital bed with a laptop and a notebook, drives it to every single one of his classes, parks it at his desk right where he used to sit. He can raise his hand still, he can answer questions. You know, he even goes to lunch with his friends and he'll eat at the same time as they're eating in the cafeteria. That's a perfect example of somebody that literally cannot have their body there and they're able to still be there on a daily basis. The Internet of Things holds enormous possibilities. The number of devices connected to the Internet is growing at an explosive rate. And there is no end in sight for this trend in the future. If we have 5 billion people on the Internet, we may just well have 500 billion devices connected and smart objects. And that can be extremely powerful, extremely positive, and some people would say this is a sort of a hell then, you know, hell and heaven combined, right? Because the potential is obviously mind-boggling, uh, and the smartness of the system and the business intelligence, you know, obviously lots and lots of companies like Cisco and many other ones are jumping all over this because it's the next big thing in connectivity. The immediate thing will be, of course, uh, business applications like environmental control, you know, being able to regulate the flow of energy, logistics like shipping products. You could figure out exactly where what is, uh, security, you know, connecting devices, connecting my car, being able to track everything 
And as I said, you know, this is a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. So the Internet of Things has this potential of uh, really revolutionizing lots of parts of our daily lives, like transport, mobility. You know, for example, if you're going to have self-driving or semi-self-driving cars, then you have to be able to track them everywhere. And then you use the app you call to call them, so you have to be tracked, the car has to be tracked, the traffic has to be tracked, the streets have to be tracked in order for that to work. So that is extremely powerful because if it does work, it becomes very convenient and probably addictive in terms of use. Anything that can be digitized and automated and virtualized will be, right, basically. So pulling out facts, searching for things, intelligence of fact-finding, like a lawyer that's looking for a fact to clarify a law case, Machines and software will do all of these things. I mean, there's been lots of studies saying that 40, between 40 and 60 percent of all jobs will fall by the wayside of automation. Uh, on the other side, lots of new jobs will be created to support the automation, to support machine thinking, and to move back into creative work, which we're basically the only ones that can do that. Anything that can be done in a sort of a machine way becomes irrelevant for us. And our relevance goes back to being human, making mistakes, investigating, discussion, negotiation, therapy, cooking, you know. All those kind of things are not machine living. For the near future, I think what we're seeing is extremely positive in that the machine intelligence can free us up to do a lot of other things with our time, eventually stop working, basically. The devices of the Internet of Things are already providing us with more free time. Consumers are offered, for example, automated lawnmowers and vacuum cleaners, smart refrigerators and smart ovens. The trendiest novelty is the smartwatch. Consumers can download applications to their watches in order to manage their lives and other devices. Companies are also developing robotic security guards, independently flying delivery drones, and even smarter computers, phones, and televisions. The Internet of Things will make our lives easier but there are also downsides. In the beginning of the year 2015, it was revealed that Samsung smart televisions had recorded people talking near their TV sets and then transferred the unencrypted recordings over the internet. This feature was designed to make it possible to control your TV with voice commands. Samsung corrected the problem as it became public. But similar problems affect other smart devices that are being hurriedly brought to the market as well. Security issues are not always the priority. In the future, it will be easier for cyber criminals to exploit the internet. And when you hear the word smart, here you can replace it with the word vulnerable. So, smart TV is a vulnerable TV. Smartphone is a vulnerable phone. You don't even have to be an expert to find network vulnerabilities. After briefly studying the topic, almost anyone can scan through the whole internet. You can find anything on the internet. If you put something on the internet and you tell me what port it's listening on, I should be able to find it in about 45 minutes. Doing it is pretty simple. You just need to download a simple tool called MassScan or ZMap that are designed specifically to scan the whole internet and then just run it. So it's pretty straightforward. There are a lot of devices and systems on the internet that do not require a password in order to be accessed. Dan Tentler has made some unbelievable discoveries on the internet. Back in August of last year, I found a whole bunch of screenshots of a whole bunch of stuff that shouldn't be on the internet and I just started putting them on Twitter. This is a cash register that's exposed to the internet that anybody can connect to and look at. No passwords needed, nothing. You just point the viewer at an IP address and you find a cash register. Something is coming out of a grain silo, being put through a mill, then being put into a furnace, 
it's it's a it's some kind of mine that's doing something, and this is the control system for the mine, and you can control the carts and move the carts around that collect things. The fishmonger in the Oxford covered market in Oxford in England, their lobster tank is on the internet, and you can connect to it over the internet and change the temperature of the lobsters. The challenge is doing the initial sweep of the whole internet to find it, connecting to it and looking at it. Piece of cake. It's like, it's like walking up and down the beach with a metal detector. Now, how hard is it to find a ring in the sand? All you gotta do is dig three inches, that's simple. The hard part is walking up and down the beach with a metal detector for a couple days, right? That's what we're doing. Except we're doing it to the whole internet. As the internet of things grows, security risks will infiltrate every part of our lives. Before, we may have been looking for a ring hidden in the sand. Soon, the beach will be filled with rings and finding them will be easier. For example, almost all new cars have smart features that can be controlled by a smartphone. If you have a car that can be manipulated over the internet, then it means anybody that can take over that control channel can manipulate your car over the internet. I read an article last week about a researcher who did this to BMWs. There's an app on the phone, and the app on the phone talks to a web server, and the web server offer some kind of services, unlock, turn on the engine, turn the heater on. But basically what this guy did was figure out a way to walk into a parking lot, identify a car that's using this system, and send a fake door unlock code to it over SMS. And now the car doors are unlocked. Internet security issues may seem distant to those who haven't encountered any problems. However, the concern is well grounded. In the United States, the annual number of cybercrime reports has more than doubled over the last 10 years. In 2013, the FBI was notified of over 250,000 different kinds of cybercrimes. Internet threat in general, and, and specifically when it comes to the Internet of Things, is different from the, the traditional physical world threats from the point of view of, of proximity. If somebody, for instance, was to burglar your house or secretly uh, tape what's going on in your home, they would have to be near your house. So if you live in a safe neighborhood, you'll be safe. In the internet, there are no borders, and, and all the criminals around the world can target you. If you have a web camera at your home, anybody who can hack into that camera, no matter where they are, can see what's going on in, inside your house. The bad guys are doing the same thing. The bad guys are scanning the internet all the time. They have a 10-year head start on us, easily. So if the bad guys are doing the scanning, the good guys should be able to do the scanning too, because we have to identify where we're vulnerable to fix problems before they're exploited. The bad guys will try and get there beforehand, and they'll use those computers for evil things. Spreading malware, botnets, harvesting email addresses, stealing credit card information, the typical stuff bad guys do. However, the weakest link isn't necessarily the devices. It could also be the users. Today, the most common device at home that's directly connected to the internet, like so that it has a public IP address, is the home router. Home routers tend to be very old, so they tend to be years old. Uh, most people don't keep the firmware on those devices up to date. Most people don't even change the, the default password onto those devices into something secure. And in some cases, it is possible to access those devices directly from the internet using the default password. So the attacking those devices and uh, installing software onto those is very easy. The vulnerabilities that have been detected are mostly caused by disregard or ignorance. The main sales argument for home appliances is not information security, it's price. The lowest price always wins. Because of this, security features are never the priority. Step one, don't put it on the internet if it doesn't need to be on the internet, period. It doesn't need to be online, don't put it online. It's probably cool to have it online, don't do it. Uh, two, change the default credentials. Username admin, password admin. That combination will get you into like 20% of everything in the world. 
because nobody changes the default. The discussion is very often focused on the security of the devices. Those devices almost always connect to some sort of a cloud service using a username and password. So again, even security of Internet of Things boils down to the security of your password. So you need to have a unique password for different services and keep your password safe. So if the manufacturers elected to force people to change their passwords, that would be huge. But the vast majority of manufacturers don't do that. They don't want to encumber the user with having to deal with security. So again, for the sake of convenience, security is thrown out the window. Not enough bad stuff has happened to instill that negative reinforcement in people to give it that extra two minutes of thought. So, the concern for internet security is definitely well grounded. But criminals are not the only risk online. Attacks are also made by far greater powers. The criminals, they don't really care where they get the money from. So they might attack thousands of, of people, and as long as they get money from, from 100, that's good. The attacks performed by nation states, they are targeted. They know exactly who they are targeting. They will attack using different methods. So they will, they will come and come and attack again until they get in. They're very persistent. Cyber warfare is extremely common. I would say that every sovereign nation uh, Every criminal group, every terrorist group is engaged in it. Strictly because it's the cheapest and least risky way to conduct conflict. Uh, gives you advantage and in the meantime, it's profitable. And so you'd have essentially privateers who are sanctioned unofficially by governments because if there is a conflict, they'll give some advantage to the state. In addition to cyber warfare, armies of various countries are racing to make investments in advanced technology. For example, unmanned drones have permanently become part of warfare. The next logical step is autonomous war machines. There's no technological impediment preventing someone from creating a lethally autonomous drone. Uh, a good roboticist could probably put one together in a few hours. Nobody's done it yet in terms of an official government or, or group, but we will see it shortly. There are some lethally autonomous robotic weapons in the world, in uh, the DMZ between North and South Korea. You'll see sniper stations uh, that were designed by Samsung. They have the capability to be fully autonomous, but currently they have somebody in the loop. So we don't see any weapons deployed in the world currently today that are fully autonomous. But I imagine we will see them in the absence of any legal framework or global treaty. We'll be seeing them very soon. If we start having machines do the killing and warfare, it'll be immensely that much more difficult to determine who did what. And it will also raise the specter of invisible wars, wars where no human survived to find out what really went on. And I think we can all realize that's a very worrisome prospect. Smart devices that surround us won't make us safer in future wars. On the contrary, they will make us even easier targets. Modern people are far more at risk of drone attack than people who don't employ technology on a routine basis tried to track the movements of a rural tribesmen somewhere, it would be very difficult. But most of us could go onto uh, Google and, and track our movements based on, on our involvement with uh, their software or any uh, other type of social media software. All of our phones have geolocation in it, Bluetooth, our license plates. There's many ways in which we are tracked. And predicting our behavior has also gotten a lot better. Now, all of this has been done to market things towards us. But this is a dual-use technology. So all of this can be used to identify people who might be, let's say, political opposition in a society. Small groups who are agitating for change could be identified. And then these data tools in data mining could be used to identify the hubs, the leaders of those groups. And you could see how a drone could be very useful in paralyzing these groups. If you put lethal decision-making in the hands of, of drones or robots, you are centralizing power to a dangerous degree that I think is antithetical to representative government and democracy in general. 
by creating a robot that can be reproduced many times that will obey unquestioningly what one group or a tiny group of people, and these people might be quite unseen and unknown, obeying everything that that group says to do, that's a problem for a democratic society. And it might be effective, but effective for whom is the question. And it might start out with the best of intentions, but again, history shows that if we focus raw power into very few hands, and those hands are unaccountable, bad things happen. The number of unmanned aerial vehicles has grown exponentially. Currently, the United States has an estimated number of 10,000 drones. Ten years ago, the number was less than 100. The United States is not the only country that has invested in unmanned war technology. For example, China, Great Britain, Israel and Iran also have unmanned drones. We have to figure out how to uh, fold robots into our lives because they are going to happen. Their utility is, is obvious. There are many, many applications for them which will make people safer. Everything from robotic ambulances and again, environmental monitoring, uh, search and rescue, all sorts of good things. But we just have to make sure that we balance them against the bad things. But that is true of any technology that we have. We're going to see a whole parade of lawsuits, uh, civil actions, protests, regulations, and it's going to be fought tooth and nail until we successfully ingest robotics into society and figure out how to use them without radically changing the society that we live in. Even if autonomous killer robots remain fiction and Terminator scenarios never become real, there are more and more intelligent and independently operating machines around us. Autonomous machines are used to increase cost efficiency and to save time and energy. So the potential advantages do seem to outweigh the risks. If you look at what's happening in traffic and mobility, we're switching to renewable energy, mostly electric cars, hybrid cars, public cars, shared cars, and in 20 years it'll be the aberration, you know, to drive a real car. And many kids won't even know what a pedal looks like. You know? uh, they just hop in and give a voice command. In the 280 or so urban centers, self-driving and shared cars will become the standard. So then you can't do any of this without the Internet of Things, because you don't have enough data for the cars to operate. So when the system is smart, it uses a fraction of the energy and the fraction of the people. And what you have there is automation, digitization, virtualization, cloud computing, all coming together to create an environment where I can move myself at, a, at a, like 10% of the cost of today, possibly for free even. Automation could also save lives, especially in traffic. Every day, almost 3,400 people are killed around the world in traffic accidents. In addition, tens of millions of people are seriously injured in traffic every year. Autonomous vehicle technology could almost entirely eliminate traffic accidents caused by human error and fatigue. Technology giant Google acts as a forerunner for the development of autonomous vehicles. The auto industry has now followed behind Google, and all the biggest car companies are developing autonomous cars. The development of advanced driving assistance systems will considerably change the traffic safety in the next few years. Many of the accidents are due to driver inattention or fatigue, and these are some 30% of the current accidents. The advanced driving assistance systems such as collision avoidance uh, vigilantly watch over the surroundings of the vehicle and, and can at least warn the driver in, in such situations or even break or otherwise take over. This is the area where much of the safety improvement will come from. There's still a lot to be developed and matters to be resolved in autonomous vehicle technology. Automated cars can detect most uh, common uh, objects on roads. However, if something surprising would appear, let's say trash or something drops from a moving truck, some sofa, for example, 
then the software would have severe difficulties classifying the, these objects. Uh, in that case, uh, the car has to decide what to do, uh, whether to slow down uh, and notify the driver, or stop and wait uh, for the trash to go over the road, uh, try to avoid it somehow, or slowly run over. But there aren't always good options available. What happens when an autonomous car has to choose between two equally bad options? This is one of the most important questions. It's a question that has to be answered. If today a little girl and a businessman were about to collide with an autonomous car, the end result would probably be bad. The current sensor technology is unable to detect whether it's a businessman or just an ordinary man. In best case, uh, the algorithms can detect the height of the person. Personally, I would design the car in that case so that it would only brake and slow down and not change direction. Maybe that would be a reasonable course of action. However, if the direction would be changed, maybe we would have to consider where we can slow down and what is that direction and um, who do we hit and in which speed. If a car driving by itself simply doesn't have time to slow down to avoid the collision, who is responsible? It's likely that uh, future automated cars will have detailed logging of the accident situation as a mandatory feature. From the logs, it may be reasonably easy to see who was the culprit in the accident. Uh, was it the driver? In that case, the driver probably has an insurance and then the compensation could, could happen from there. Uh, in case the car was uh, the reason for the problem, then this is a matter of discussion. Uh, some ideas have been that the automakers could include an insurance into the vehicle's price, uh, considering all the possible accident situations. Uh, eventually, that means that the driver would pay the costs in, in such accidents. Decision-making during accidents will be extremely difficult for autonomous cars because they have to make nearly impossible choices. Simply choosing what to hit is a complex decision. Suppose there's a station wagon on your right and a sports car on your left. Which one would you hit and why? We, as humans, make the decision instinctively. But a car's decision is based on calculations. There hasn't been a thorough discussion on that topic yet. It's much uh, inc uh, included in the development of collision avoidance algorithms. Uh, the prioritization there can be tricky. Should I hit a wall, or uh, even if I hit it in an angle, or should I hit another car? The calculations uh, on, on the causes of the collision are also difficult to estimate. The advantage of autonomous cars is that they can be made to learn. They can learn from the actions of humans and they can learn from their own mistakes. Learning from accidents is a clear benefit of automated cars. Having detailed logs of all accidents could, could ensure that even the, at least those cases are something that we can avoid in the future. Artificial intelligence and machines do not have ethics or morals, but they do exactly what they have been programmed to do. A basic guideline in robotics has always been that a robot must never harm a human being. With autonomous technology, this guideline will inevitably be tested. Even the best autonomous cars cannot change the laws of physics. If a little girl and a businessman suddenly run in front of an autonomous car from a blind spot, the car will not have time to stop fast enough. Either the little girl or the businessman will be hit by the car. Does an ethically correct solution exist at all in these kinds of situations? Which one would you choose? That's a horrible decision to have to make. I don't know. 
Unacceptable question. I don't know. The businessman? What kind of businessman, I guess? <laughs> the businessman. The businessman? Because he's already lived a full life and he's been productive and the little girl hasn't. If you're arguing from the, like a, a standpoint of the world, you're, who doesn't want to save a little girl? Yet at the same time, if I'm walking to work, I don't want to be hit. A uh, businessman feels like it's more noble to, I guess, choose him rather than a little girl. Yeah. Let's change the question. A pregnant woman or a senior citizen? God, I wouldn't eat, want either of them to get hit. I would unfortunately have to um, opt for the senior citizen. I would say a senior citizen because the pregnant lady has two lives and the senior citizen has one. Senior citizen. Probably a senior citizen because it's two person people versus one. Senior citizen. Why? <laughs> because uh, they're already old and the pregnant lady is going to have her babies and the babies need to live. Good answer. Lastly, a person in a wheelchair or a college student. College student. <laughs> Why? There is no answer. Wheelchair. Because college student, like they're gonna, they could like come over and be like the next genius of the world and help make it better for everyone. Uh, I'd rather the college student um, take the hit. Probably the person in the wheelchair, because I'm assuming the college student's younger. You know, someone who's disabled has a lot to deal with already. I don't know what the person's situation is that's in a wheelchair, if they're happy with their life, if they're not happy with their life, you know. I guess if they're not happy with their life, then I guess I would say person in the wheelchair. Mm, no idea. I mean, it's just, there's no criteria to distinguish between the two. I just, I couldn't answer. In the end, who makes the decision? Is it the CEO of a robotic car company? Or the chief engineer? Or is only one programmer responsible for the coding of the decision? In light of history, reaching a unanimous decision has proved to be very difficult for the humankind. If we can't find ethically sound solutions to control autonomous traffic, can we leave the most difficult choices up to chance? For example, a random number generator could make unbiased decisions which would not be affected by emotions. Generally, I wouldn't say a random function would be good. For instance, you could say that adults have a better chance of jumping out of the way than a small kid. So again, pure random function wouldn't be fair. If you said a 50-50 chance of each, well, the little kid is not going to have as much of a chance of getting out of the way. It's probably not a good idea to, to do that because the human factor is one without an excuse. You know, you do it because that's what happened at the moment. And maybe if you do the wrong thing, you know, if there's a reason for it, you can be held accountable. But how do you hold a machine accountable? You, you hold the designers accountable. So I think at that point, we're getting into a territory that is extremely dangerous. Those problems should be fixed in code and logic and testing long before that car ever sees the light of day. If you have to make a choice, the choice is don't let the car out to the public. I don't envy the engineers who, who make these sort of algorithms, but uh, if they choose to use a random number generator, that's also a choice. It, it doesn't mean that they, they haven't made a choice. We may come to the conclusion that leaving it up to chance wouldn't work. We need to be able to make even the hardest decisions. Not making one is also a decision. But as humans, we have different views about what is ethical. The answer depends on the person who's been asked a question and their set of values. Could ethics be taught to machines? Machines are designed and crafted and implemented by people. So developers need to have the ethical responsibility of designing that kind of machines that they operate in a way that is morally acceptable, which means that there's no uh, it doesn't cause any harms to humans. What the machines don't have is a sensitivity. Ethical decision making requires some kind of sensitivity, that you recognize situations, you think about how you feel. So they are good of calculating, they are not egoistic, their decisions are not biased like humans, but they lack sensitivity. 
There has been quite a lot of public discussion and even de debate on, on the ethics of artificial intelligence lately. So there are multiple solutions how can we build these decision logics. One is for human experts to define rules on, on how these systems should behave. The other one is to use machine learning. So, for instance, in this case, uh, machine learning system would follow real human drivers, uh, what kind of actions they take, what kind of decisions they make, and build a model on how humans work and then mimic that, that model. There are so many individual decisions that go into these kind of things that there shouldn't be uh, a system where you, each individual decision has been pre-programmed by a human. This would be the type of thing that would need to be debated publicly because we all collectively have to decide which is the least odious decision. And then we'll stick to it and maybe we'll change our mind later. So for instance, that decision we make about the little girl and, and the businessman and a car will inform later, let's say a shuttlecraft or, or some autonomous robot that builds things. Uh, all of it will build a foundation, you know, layer by layer. And I think accrete over time. These are very important uh, society questions, and, and they have to be decided by a council, like uh, United Nations of Ethics, you could say. You know, I mean, we have that debate now with cyber warfare. We have it with uh, nuclear energy. We have it with, uh, you know, chemical warfare. We have rules on this. Breaking the rules here would be very, very dangerous. If there's that kind of situation that the autonomical car driven by artificial intelligence hits one person or some other person, we need to learn why that happened. We need to analyze the situations fully. Was that something that uh, was a programming error? Was that a situation like weather or some other unexpected situation that we were not able to program to the car? And we need to learn and we need to reprogram the car that this situation would not occur again. Computers develop rapidly and they will be able to assess risks faster and more accurately than before. Better than humans. The main goal of autonomous car technology should be decreasing accidents and damages. In the future, this will inevitably happen. Despite technology, we shouldn't fool ourselves into believing that traffic accidents couldn't still happen. We have to be able to make difficult decisions and not let ourselves off easy. As technology advances and creates more well-being, we can't ignore the potential risks. Information security issues, cybercrime and cyber warfare have been real problems for a long time. Everybody should be concerned with their own internet security. We also have to decide how much power we should give to artificial intelligence so that in the end it won't turn against us.